all these musical motifs that are just mother's milk to me and was able to put them here and have a Western classical orchestra playing these things is a little tricky because there's these things that they do, little mordants and strange inflections and things that just give it that feel. But if you put them on the page, this orchestra has completely nailed them. They, these guys, like, it sounds like these guys grew up in Turkey. <laughs> the other thing I would say is that like a great painter has a palette of all sorts of colors, <clears throat> Composers often use a few colors or ones that they're used to, usually used to using. Stewart has used the entire <laughs> palette of orchestral colors, which is very exciting to go along with the Turkish uh, sound and everything. So, yeah, I use the flutes, I use the violins, <laughs> even the, the even the the, the, the long-suffering unheralded viola gets some beautiful parts because I love that range of the string section. So the viola have a big role in this piece. There's a viola player right there who just whooped. <laughs> and, and there was a comment down at the front here, no, there is no combo. <laughs> but there's all kinds of other metallic objects that will be aggressed upon with vigor. Another question. Right there, young man. When did I start playing? At about your age. <laughs> I mean, the sooner the better. The, you know, I think music comes to some people at different points in life, but the sign, if your child, if you're wondering if they're going to be a musician, the first indication, the first clue, is if you can't stop them. <laughs> if you're having to send your child to violin lessons, if you have to say, now Joey, it's time for your pra piano practice, get him into like a lawyer thing, dentist, <laughs> any other career. Because the, 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 the distinctive feature of the future musician is that you can't get them to stop. Can you, get, can you be stopped, young man? No! no. <laughs> now, there I think you should get, get your mom to get you a microphone, because everybody works for the singer. <laughs> Any comment on that? Uh, no, I think uh, starting young <clears throat> is essential. I started playing violin at, at seven. I just got little laryngitis last night. I can't explain why. I will not be singing tonight. Um, but when you... Were singing last night in the crew party? <laughs> was not. Uh, but I think starting young is fantastic, and especially not just playing exercises, but playing music and listening to all kinds of music. One of the reasons Stuart is such an accomplished musician is because he has embraced all kinds and all styles of music and that has led to the kind of score that he's able to write. We met when I was at MGM supervising music and we worked on some projects and uh, the world sort of came to know him as a drummer. However, uh, this is a consummate composer. In May, a piece of his will be premiered by the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic. The Dallas Symphony has uh, commissioned a piece that he, that he has written. So uh, this is sort of uh, you know, a man of many talents, and he's using them all. And they all started at uh, a very young age, listening and playing. So. so we're expecting to see a couple of symphonies out of you by, you know, 14. <laughs> There's one right there. Since I started writing orchestral work till now, what is the one biggest thing you learned about that process of writing? Well, the the thing that you have to learn, the music is already there. You know, in your head, theoretically, if you're a composer, the reason you're a composer is because there's music swirling around in your head. And how do I get this out of my head and onto tape or into the world so that people can hear it? Now, for me, the easiest way to begin with was to pick up a guitar, bang on a drum, and do it with these bare hands. And that's what rock and roll is all about, where you get a bunch of guys together and you pick up instruments and you make a noise yourself. But the big difference between rock and roll and orchestral music is really not so much a difference of style, of what it sounds like, it's a difference of how you create the music. And the rock and rollers get into a room together and they look at each other and say, Dude, I got this thing in egg. Da, 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 da. 
that's great. Yeah, okay. Uh, that, and he thinks of something. And it's a kind of a collaboration. He says, do, 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 that's great. That's great. Or that sucks. You know, one way or the other, it's a negotiation. Everybody gets to make up their own part. And if you choose the right guys, everybody makes up their own part and it comes together. With orchestral music, the music is very different, but the fundamental difference is technique. Uh, for that music, there's no negotiation. It's in your head, you put it on the page, you put it on the stand, you count it in. You have a talented maestro who knows what he's doing counted in, and it gets played. And so you have to be able to take this stuff here and get it onto the page, which takes a little bit of Italian. It takes little actual an education and music to understand what those little dots mean. But interestingly, um, music is a lot simpler language to learn. Music of the written note. It's easier than French. It's easier than learning Italian, for crying out loud, which I've been trying to learn for years. Just you only need a few of them. Molto it just sounds so great. I'm not even sure what that one means. But I generally write my scores in English, but there's a few things that the violin players like to see in Italian just because they, they know what that means when they see that there. So, rock and roll, you make it up as you go along. Orchestral music, whether it's classical or modern or anything, when you write it down, you think of it first and you get it on the page. And that skill of getting it on the page is not such a big deal. The big deal part of it is What's it going to sound like? Because it's in your head, and you put it on the page, and the guys play it, and then you're kind of hoping that that's, that's what it was. So that's the biggest difference there. Any comment? I would add one thing, that with a score like you're going to hear tonight, it's on the page, and it's beautifully written, but it takes a great orchestra not just to play it technically, but to interpret it and make the music happen, not just the notes happen. And this orchestra, uh, you are going to hear uh, quite a performance tonight by this orchestra. They, they, as I say, they get it. They understand that the notes are in black and white, but the music uh, is quite a bit more than that. And so we've been you know, just loving working with this group because they are so musical and they understand it. And you're in for a really thrilling performance by these great musicians. If you had been here last night, you would have not only heard this great orchestra playing this music, you would have heard me sobbing. <laughs> because I've been working with a synthesizer, but to get here with this orchestra, really playing in actual humans with human frailty and human strengths, swaying and heaving. I'm over there on the drums trying to be like the composer do, but I'm sobbing. <laughs> right there. After the uh, inevitable huge success of this premiere tonight, <laughs> do you have a plan for... Uh, well, you just ruined it right there. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a plan for... Performances around the country? Yes. Um, the, the, the question was after tonight's performance, I'll leave out those wonderful, <laughs> kind words there because they don't sound as good coming from me. After tonight's performance, what happens next with this piece? Well, uh, this is as far as I've thought through. Getting to here tonight, to getting to these rehearsals, it took me three years to write the score, 340 pages, and that's just his score. When you add all those scores sitting on this, it's something like 2,500 pages or something of score. It's, it's, it's just getting here spelled okay with the sound elements, cutting the picture. It's hard to even think beyond here. And the, the Virginia Arts Festival has brought it here, and they've invested heavily in developing this piece and giving us the resources with the technology, with the crew, with the time to get it right. We've had three days in this hall to get it right. And so really, this is a Virginia Arts Festival piece. In the future, it will play. The mighty Chicago Symphony is booked to date in October. Um, and we're working on some other dates which are not inked yet. And the minute those words come out of my mouth, it's over. So <coughs> I'll, I'll just leave you with Chicago. And he also said one thing that we have to add. This is not just putting an orchestra on the stage and turning on the projector. This crew here in this hall that has worked on this uh, they are amazing because it is a very complicated issue to present this film. There are all sorts of technical requirements that go into this uh, sound, the visual, uh, just everything. And so uh, I'm just been, I've been amazed by this great crew here working on this show. It's the it's one of the main reasons it's going to happen at all. Gentlemen, right there. Oh my goodness, a gracious of me. 
I have seen this movie quite a few times. You know, after finishing the score, the process was that I, I had the movie off a DVD. You know, if you buy the Charlton Heston version, a rather more modern kind of art house version of Ben Hur, Tale of the Christ, if I may say so. Uh, this version you're going to see tonight is 20 times as big in terms of a cast of, you know, you've heard of cast of thousands. This movie has a cast of 125,000. So this is enormous. The movie, uh, and the things you're seeing are not CGI. It somehow has more of an emotional impact when you realize these people are actually doing this stuff. Um, and now I've completely forgotten your question. Oh, how many times have I seen the movie? Well, after preparing, first of all, so I got the movie off the DVD. I burnt it. Don't tell anybody from where I I ripped it off the DVD. And I cut the music, smushed the music that I had already written for the stage production together and ended up with the 90 minute thing. Then, by now, um, Derek Power is working his way through the labyrinth of Warner Brothers to get the rights to the original film. Then I get the original movie, this 80 year old celluloid in about 12 cans. The cans are about that big and that thick. And this venerable old lady is 80 years old. We get them and it takes 10 days to defrost. And so we tell a cine, and I put, you know, I get my new digitized version of the movie and I put it up against the music that I wrote. Oh my gosh, it's a different length. All the shots are either longer or shorter. So I, I then had to go back into every single shot in the movie and figure out and smush it a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. Because I've already, by that time, I've already got the score written. I can, oh my God, it's a little bit shorter. What am I going to do? Speed it up? No, that's, you know. So I, the, the movie and the music kind of came together, sort of togetherly. <laughs> and that involved watching the movie a lot of time. Then, once I've got it, and I think, wait, that scratch there, that scratch there. Then there was the dust and scratches, which was about two weeks of obsession. I must have cleaned two, three, four hundred frames where there's a, just a big scratch on the screen. And so I take the next frame, I copy that frame, put it on top of this one, then crop the overlay like that. So it's just that where the scratch is, that bit of sky right there. Bang, that's one clean. It, take, it takes about almost that, as long as it took me to tell you how to do it, but there's so many of them. And then I, cool, I've done that, and I look at the movie, and I can already see a hundred more scratches. So the movie is, it's like a Bob Dylan album. Ain't a Bob Dylan album without the scratches. <laughs> right here. Well, the, oh, the, the, was there a particular scene that inspired the whole deal? And the, there were many. It was looking at the spectacle of the film. As it unfolds, it's kind of hard to pick out one scene that did that. But there were things that surprised me. Of course, the chariot race is mind-boggling. Of course, the big pirate battle was really something. But what I didn't expect was the spiritual aspect of this film. This is a very religious film. It's true title, unlike the Charlton Heston art movie. Uh, the true title is Ben-Hur, A Tale of the Christ. And when you remember that, and you see this version of the film, which is much truer to the book, to General Lew Wallace's book, where the point of the thing is these two parallel lives that inter intersect at various critical points. You know, when Jesus, uh, when um, Ben-Hur is banished to the galleys, sent off in slavery by his best friend, he comes and he's there struggling across the desert, and they arrive at Nazareth. I'm not going to tell you what happens then, but these scenes, you could guess, uh, but these scenes where the spirituality, where Jesus Christ and, Ju and Judah Ben-Hur come together are actually, in many ways, emotionally, even more powerful than the action scenes. Absolutely, and <clears throat> this movie, what, over two and a half hours long, Stuart has edited it down to about 90 minutes. And it's a much better film because it's all tightened up. Purist would say, how could you do that? Well, fortunately, you did it. And uh, it's a, just a much better film. Many people who have seen this movie will have only seen it on the small screen. So to see it in this pristine fashion on the big screen with a live orchestra is going to be a very unique experience. You will never see this movie that way again unless you come to Chicago Symphony in October. And there are people, probably some of them back there with their pitchforks already, they're going to come for me. Because something that struck me was that 
Fred Niblo made this two and a half hour movie with this unbelievable resources. And as I started to work with it, first of all, I was kind of cavalier. I'm thinking, oh, I'm just going to put some pictures up on the screen. I've got my music. I can play a show. Get out my drums. What more do you need? But then I started to watch the movie and started to drink the Kool-Aid and started to realize the power. And my respect for Fred Niblo grew and grew and grew. So then my, my, my whole motivation was to respect his vision and try and be as true as possible to his concept of what he was trying to say. Let's get, get back. We'll come back to you in a minute. We've done this road back there. I know that editing a narrative story, editing is actually the third time a film is written. Yeah. So the hearing that The question was, did I consult with professional editors or story editors or continuity folks? No. <laughs> Maybe I should have, but you know, I don't, I, I, whether I know what I'm doing or not, I work alone. You know, and I, get, I just got my hands on it. I probably should have called somebody, but I was too busy doing it. And I'm a kind of a frustrated, I'm an app freak, you know, whether it's Photoshop or Final Cut Pro or, or Premiere or After Effects or, or, or Digital Performer or Pro Tools, you, Instagram, whatever. I love doing this kind of thing and nothing could stop me. I probably should have called some professionals, but I just did it myself. The great uh, film composer Elmer Bernstein, who wrote Magnificent Seven, The Ten Commandments, uh, and so many other films, he was on, once asked, what is the most important trait for a film composer? And the answer was to be, above all, a great dramatist. Stewart is a great dramatist. He looks at the screen, so the editing that he has done is the same as if he's watching a film and having the music underscore the story. Uh, there's a gut feeling you get when there's like, a, oh, wait a minute, that's not quite right. So it's seamless, and, uh, and the story is, is perfectly told still. Well, also there's another feature, which is that I spent 20 years before the mast as a professional film composer, which is the world of post-production. So I've sat with editors, and I've sat with directors trying to clean up the mess of what they shot, <laughs> and, the sh and the shots that they didn't get. And so I actually learned a lot about post-production and what those issues of storytelling, you know, you've already shot the thing, Boy, wait a minute, that's not, you know, smushing the shots together. Uh, something I actually do have some experience with. Right back there. Yes, you. Hi, um, this actually feeds into what you just said. Um, I actually met you on a street in 1984 in Nairobi. Nairobi. Uh, we met in Nairobi. <laughs> Well, I guess that was one of my early experiences in post. She was asking about The Rhythmatist, which is a film that I made years ago. And I was just the artist in the movie. I didn't actually make the film, although when we got home, I ended up banging the director's head against the wall. And uh, he's one of my best friends, but we have very different sensibilities. The story of my life. Uh, and, and so I was there, and we, we, were the, the, we were in Africa, and the idea was to cross Africa and record the music and find... I was looking for elements of American music that obviously came from Africa. I was looking for the blue note, the flattened seven. I was looking for the steady rhythm, the four on the floor rhythms. You know, these characteristics that define American music as distinct from Mozart and what we got from Europe. American music is unique in the world. You know, I didn't find American music in Africa. I found Africans playing the music that they heard on the radio from America on electric guitar and on a drum set. And they were doing kind of different things from it. But the places where I went out into the bush, in the cities, what you hear is kind of African versions of American music. Um, but in the bush, that's where you hear the true African stuff. And there was no 4-4. Four -four. It's, it's compound meter. It's one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, and, and, it's, and it's, it's basically because it's based on a sentence in their language. I'm feeling groovy tonight. I want to go out with you, baby. Let's go get, get it on. That's the rhythm. <laughs> That's the meter. That's the time signature is that sentence in whatever language that could be. Um, and I, the, as far as these harmonic elements that, that, that came from Africa that are not Mozart, 
That I sort of found everywhere. They had just different scales. And I assumed that when Africans mingled with Europeans in America, that this distinctively American scale, the blues scale, came from this cross-pollination. And so I was able to find these kind of ingredients, but they weren't the cake yet. And I suppose that was surprising. I was expecting to go find John Lee Hooker in Nairobi. <laughs> no, the proto-John Lee Hooker was in Nairobi. Right here. You know the most terrifying thing, how to really terrify orchestral players, is the simple words, uh, see this bars uh, 16 through 24? Just make something up, just <laughs> improvise. That is the scariest word for the readers and the orchestra. You know, for, in my world, you know, hey, who's gonna play the solo? And everybody's fighting, oh, I got it, I got it, I'm gonna play the solo, you know. You know, with, a, with an orchestra, you say, look, I got 16 bars here, I haven't really, I just kinda, Who's got a solo? And a horn brass section. Come on, trumpet. Yeah. Shirley's, they're all. <laughs> and, and it's kind of an interesting thing is that, that rock musicians are in awe of readers. Gosh, you can read. That's amazing. How can you read? And then the readers are in awe of the improvisers. I call them rockers and orcs. These two different, very divided, different kinds of musicians. And so here, I'm improvising all over the place because that's what I do. Everybody else, there's 65 guys out there with every note on the page. But I'm just making it up as I go along. Do <laughs> you have anything to add to that? No, I hope it goes well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope so because it's on the page. Now let's go down here in the front. The question is, will there ever be, ever be something that you could take home, a DVD? Uh, the answer is, absolutely not, maybe. <laughs> because it's a strange animal. It's, you know, the movie that Mr. Niblo made is two hours and 20 minutes long. That's his movie. It's tempting for me, and I do fall into thinking of it as my movie, because I've worked so hard on it, and I've got my music, and I've, got, and I've cut it up, and I'm working on my computer screen, and I, and I talk about, hey, my movie. It's not my movie. It's Mr. Fred Niblo's movie. You know, and it's... So, the idea of releasing a cut version of his movie, there's just something not quite right about it. But you give me a minute or two to think on it, and I'll come up with some kind of logic to make it okay. But there's another problem. What do you, you know, are you watching me on the drums or the orchestra? It's a movie, so it's just a movie with a score. And... That makes it even more uncomfortable as far as, as, as um, you know, ruining the original concept. I think if you want to see the movie, you should probably respect Mr. Niblo and see, you know, if you're going to be at home or something out there, you're going to buy it. Go for his version. I don't want to compete with his movie. It's his movie. Right here in the front. Of course, you could just release a CD of your score to go with Ben Hur instead of a DVD. Uh, well, now, the question was, um, how about just a CD? Well, the, mu the music is kind of goes with the movie, and you take the movie away, and there's some skinny passages in there. You know, with the, with the two-hour version, there actually was a score written in the 60s by Sir Colin Davies, um, and he scored all two and a half hours of it, and he's a fantastic composer, but his music is stretched over two and a half hours, I mean, I, you know, there's not a man alive who could, unless you're Wagner, of course, uh, but he was, the, 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 uh, the drama was written around his music, he wasn't scoring a scene. So, probably not a CD either, folks, so listen up tonight. Right there, right there. Didn't quite hear that. Did anyone? Why? Because I'm lazy. <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, the, no. That's a good question. Why did I not do the whole movie? Um, 
couple of reasons. One is that two and a half hours was a, a format that they had in those days. All the movies were incredibly long. And I think modern folks, okay, I'll, let me just speak for myself. <laughs> two and a half hour movie, um, where's the men's room? <laughs> uh, and so I didn't feel like I could keep an orchestra in the pit for two and a half hours. I didn't feel that I could stretch, you know, I saw what Sir Colin Davies, this estimable composer, how he was stretched kind of thin. I just figured, let's have a modern, con well, the other thing is it started as a concert with, a, with some kind of thing, something, pictures to do with chariots or something. But then I discovered the film, and the film became more and more important. By that time, I had a 90-minute concert. And so that's a very good question. I stand, the, the, those pitchfork folks are going to come after me for cutting this movie down. But I think I've got it in a, in a, in a fashion that is a through line. There was a couple of plot lines that I had to lose. The, the, this version is very true to the book. And the book has a lot of kind of diversions and, and other storylines that don't really have to do that much with Ben-Hur and his, you know, this rivalry, these two friends. Okay, I'm, 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 there's a hook coming out here like this. <laughs> One more question, right there. Have I modified the drum set? No, I've had to, the drum set's the same drum set, but I've had to modify me. Uh, I have to play very delicately, because usually I go on stage with two guys with gigantic amplifiers, and I gotta be King Kong out there, and it just, you know, this is very nuanced, and there's two guys, the composer dude and the drummer dude, and the composer dude writes a nice, poignant little piece for the woodwinds. This beautiful little oboe melody that just yearns. And then, as a, the composer dude is writing, I'm thinking, Copeland, do not mess this up when you get on those drums. Okay? Now I'm here, my drums are there. I'm the drummer dude, it's my name on the ticket. And, uh, and it's this clash of things, and you know, in, in my band there's a lot of conflict over the composer, you know, the sanctity of the composer, and I have nothing but sympathy for my colleagues who've written a beautiful piece of music and now have to negotiate with the gosh darn drummer. Wow, I'm the drummer dude is here tonight, folks. And so I'm just going to make it up as I go along, but I have to play very quietly, that's what I have to modify, is to play very sensitively and quietly, you know. My drum set built for rock and roll, 70 guys, it's not a fair fight. <laughs> As we wrap this up, first I just want to say, Stuart's been working on this for over three years. And uh, the reason that it's happening is because the Virginia Arts Festival is, has such a great vision for not just music that's been played, but also for breaking new ground. So uh, Rob Cross, I know speaking for Stuart, you know, to thank you uh, for the <laughs> It's time. I'll see you all in a few minutes.